Hey you, it's been a while. Lots has happened here since the last update to my mod series, huh? Well, it's finally time to dive back into Halo. We return once more to Halo Combat Evolved Rebalanced. Up to now, my rebalanced mods have striven to tweak the weapon, vehicle, and AI sandbox to create a more gratifying, decision-based game by flushing out the roles of all the tools at your disposal, on top of various quality of life changes, difficulty tweaks, and more. Sadly, updates to the Master Chief Collection have rendered all of them unplayable without forcefully reverting the game version. The good news, though, is that the devs working on MCC are kind enough to develop new and improved mod tools for every single game which not only makes it much easier for the mods to withstand game updates, but allows us a whole new world of freedom to Halo modding these games I've never seen. Thanks to many outside perspectives of the community, with feedback on all my existing mods, I've learned a lot about the underlying technical and design aspects of Halo. So now the scope of Halo CE Rebalanced is bigger than ever before. When it comes to new content, gameplay and technical polish, quality of life tweaks, and much more. Keep in mind, many of the exciting new stuff you're going to see would not have been possible without the many contributions and collaboration of many, many other modders. Thanks to all these folks and their shared passion for Halo CE, we have a wide variety of new tools at our disposal. Whether it be new content to spice things up or restoring pieces of CE that were lost in development. So big thank yous to all of them and their help in building this game to something bigger and better than we found it. From this point on, as I tackle each of my rebalanced mods one by one with the mod tools, along with the main version, I'll always include a separate light version purely containing the weapon, vehicle, and AI stat changes and most important quality of life adjustments. For those who want that more pure vanilla experience, just touched up so the game's rough parts are ironed out. Worth noting too that the mod tools lack support for the anniversary visuals of CE and 2. The more you add or customize, the more broken the remastered graphics will look. As the main version of CE Rebalanced is now, anniversary graphics will straight up crash the game from the breadth of new content added. So be aware, they are disabled, and you should always start up the game with the classic option set as the default. However, as Rebalanced Lite has a much smaller scope, the anniversary graphics will always be compatible with it. This journey of making Halo mods has been some of the most fun I've ever had with the game series. CE Rebalanced 3.0 has been a project several months in the making, some of which I streamed over on Twitch. What? <laughs> What is he doing? What are they doing? And you can bet I'll be doing the same once I get to the other games. If you guys will humor me for a sec, I just want to mention that I've been at this YouTube thing for over 10 years by this point. 10 years of making a full-on fan-made Pokemon anime, most of which has been done on my own, while also dipping my feet into video essays about my favorite game series and, obviously, these mod showcases. So if you'll let me, I'd like to ask that you chip in any amount of support to my Patreon. I'd really appreciate it. You'll have to bear with me as plugging like this is sort of a necessary evil when it comes to this platform. Today, though, I want to take a bit of a different approach to my other showcase videos. I want to do a deep dive into the design of Halo CE and really get to the meat of what makes this game so good. Because obviously that'll better inform any changes that we want to make. The luxury of modding is that we have the power of hindsight in an already released game in a long-running series. So with that in mind, let's jump in and explore the design pillars of this classic FPS game that we all know and love. Halo, developed by Bungie, a real-time strategy game turned third-person shooter turned first-person shooter. With the buyout from Microsoft, it was slated to be a launch title for the original Xbox, and thus was tasked with making an FPS that was accessible and intuitive to play on consoles, and blowing audiences away with a scale and ambition never before seen in gaming. It's common knowledge by this point that Bungie had a turbulent time deciding what kind of game they wanted this to be. Shifting genres twice, blowing through several story and gameplay revisions, but coming out the other side with lightning in a bottle. Halo was a success in every regard. Indeed, it blew audiences away with the scale of its world, visuals, music, and storytelling style, but most importantly, strong staying power through its gameplay. Viscerally and immediately satisfying, featuring a memorable sandbox of guns, vehicles, and AI, with a thoughtfully designed and paced gameplay loop that offered lots of depth to learn and master, making shooting on a console more natural and fun than it had ever been up to that point. 
All these elements culminated into an instant, unforgettable classic. So, let's explore those elements that made Halo CE so successful. What kind of game is Halo, exactly? Throughout Bungie's experimentation with the perspective and genre this game would take, they found themselves closing in more and more on the action taking place, and the character in the center of it all. And then, you know, we started to move the camera in closer and closer to the character. What if we put ourselves in this character? What if we became that character? Finding it most fun and compelling to partake in the action from a more intimate view, instilling a sense of epic heroism in this vast new world. And the design of the game all followed from that pivotal choice of perspective. Bungie game designer at the time, Jamie Griesmer, often invoked a gameplay philosophy called the 30 seconds of fun when it came to building a compelling experience. Boiling down into three parts, the most immediate aspect being the base interactions with the game world. Firing your weapons, seeing and hearing how the in-game actors and environment reacts, how the game feels to play, how it clicks. Halo CE clearly takes this aspect very seriously, deliberately using stark, contrasting visual effects and distinct sound design to give the most basic interactions with the game visceral texture. Even before designing the game to be played on console, Bungie had set their mind to simplifying the first-person shooter formula of that era, streamlining the inputs to lower barrier to entry as much as possible. The idea being, the less mental bandwidth players spend learning how to interface with the game on a basic level, the more room for complex interplay you can give to a diverse sandbox and distinct AI behavior. It's one thing to have an intuitive, punchy action game with a bunch of cool weapons, but what kind of game do you make from there? How do you make gameplay that is meaningful and interesting? Among the many changes meant to streamline the FPS formula was the limitation of only holding two weapons at a time. This simple mechanic informed the entire design of the weapon sandbox. Because you were limited to two, it became all the more important to decide what weapons to carry depending on the situation, as they naturally developed distinct roles from one another. Paired with the focus on unique AI archetypes and behaviors, the gameplay culminated into strategizing in the moment to moment, all about thoughtfully engaging with the sandbox and tools on offer. And I think this is the core of what makes that 30 seconds of fun so compelling. The cherry on top being, every 30 seconds of fun should be unique from the last, always being put in a new context. Halo's gameplay is always mixing itself up. One moment you'll be facing infantry in close quarters, the next you'll be sniping in a wide open space from a vantage point, the next you'll be blasting through rolling fields and high octane vehicle action. You need that 30 seconds, and then you need to put it inside of a context that is constantly changing. And because every encounter is different from the last, you're encouraged to rotate your two weapons to experiment and strategize for the new situations. The success of this design philosophy speaks for itself, iterated on with each Halo game since, which helped take this series from one legendary game to a legendary series. So, with a fresh understanding of the 30 seconds of fun, let's see how we can reapply it to this classic game, in retrospect of playing it for 20 years and much to learn from other titles in the series. Let's dive into the rebalance of Halo Combat Evolved. How about we start small? The first pillar of the 30 seconds of fun, the game feel and feedback. In my onion, CE bar none features the best visual and audio feedback out of the entire series. Bright glowing shield flares, huge blood splatters, swirling puffs of smoke from explosions, and booming, juicy, and recognizable sounds from the weapons to boot. It should go without saying that before anything else, a game should feel good to play. So let's look into some of the changes which can improve upon the most basic game feel of CE. Starting with the player itself. Halo CE has the lowest jump height out of any Halo game, 2 and 3 showing that higher jump velocity allows for more potential and the vantage points you can reach. So it's been extended here for that reason, letting you more often take advantage of the verticality and level design, albeit not quite as high as those two games. By a similar vein, I feel the vanilla fall damage height was too punishing. I think fall damage is valuable in lending these environments a sense of scale to ensure traversing it isn't a careless endeavor, but I've tweaked the height and damage to be a bit more reasonable for your stature as an armored super soldier. With Bungie's efforts to streamline how an FPS plays, Halo gives instant access to your grenades and melee at all times. Two permanent fixtures of your character that assist in complementing your gunplay. The damage roll on your standard melee attack was always pretty random, sometimes leading to the weakest enemy in the grunt, tanking three hits in a row, which doesn't feel quite right. So that standard melee damage has been tweaked to be more consistent. Halo CE's frag grenades are without a doubt my favorite in the series. 
Featuring a huge explosion radius perfect for wiping out tightly cluttered enemies, a very valuable tool in your arsenal with lots of consideration for when you use it. The only caveat being is that its physics were kinda awkwardly sluggish. When bounced off hard surfaces that spent a bit too much time in the air, which could be frustrating in frenetic panic situations, where a frag could be the difference between life and death. So, I've made its physics on these surfaces behave more similarly to Halo 2 and 3, better able to roll along the ground and more naturally bounce up and down to begin its detonation timer. For a quality of life improvement, I've enlarged and extended the range of your flashlight just a tad. Halo CE has a ton of dark, moody areas, and sometimes in vanilla your light strength would fall a tad short, so this is to ensure players can always get a good grasp of the environment and encounter, especially given the flashlight's limited battery power. Here's a fun fact, having your flashlight on while using active camo actually makes enemies able to see you after a few seconds of line of sight, which makes sense in theory, yet for some reason camo disables the beam of your flashlight. So this probably resulted in a lot of confusion as to why enemies were seeing you while invisible. Now, the flashlight is visible while under camo, so the mechanic is more intuitive and you can actually see where you're going with it active in dark areas. Something that you don't really notice until pointed out is that Halo CE is very sparse on screen impulses for firing your weapon. Compare that to every other Halo game where all weapons have their own screen shake animation. I believe this is a subtle but important effect in giving every weapon texture to its use, so everyone now has some form of screen impulse for not only firing, but also meleeing. Every weapon has its own melee screen impulse to match the respective animation, really adding to the punchy and innately satisfying feel of combat. One thing I wanted going into this mod was to account for many of the redundant weapon sounds. The plasma pistol's firing sounds in particular get recycled all over the place, where future Halo games would go on to give every piece of the sandbox their own distinct sound. I think it's better to have weapons sound unique from each other, not only so they feel distinct to use, but it's also important to gameplay that you be able to tell what weapon is in use on the field even if you don't see the enemy wielding it yet. So several weapons and vehicles now use their respective sounds from future games. I've always loved how Bungie's Halo games, from start to finish, maintained a consistent soundscape that was iterated on with each successive game. So in addition to diversifying the weapon sounds, I think it's good to backport some of that consistency to CE, wherever it was missing. Similarly missing in the first game, the grunts lacked the soft ping animation, the quick flinch when shot, as seen in every later Halo game. Thanks goes to the modder FD for their custom animation here that allows combat versus grunts to feel a lot punchier. On a similar note, the flood combat forms now have a pop effect that plays upon death. Thanks to modder My Name is Lowell, not only making dispatching them feel more gooey and satisfying, but also giving you a tell for when they're playing possum or truly deceased. Lastly, when it comes to the immediate gameplay feedback, the death explosion of Covenant vehicles has been made a plasma blue for consistency with future halos and to better match the expected makeup of Covenant tech. All this visual audio feedback is important to polishing the game feel of CE, but they're just the tip of the iceberg as we move on to the meat of this game. The core of Halo's gameplay lies in its sandbox. The depth coming from that weapon interplay and how it interacts with the various AI you'll face. Deciding what weapons to use for the situation is a strong part of Halo, and something I've always been passionate about exploring and expanding in my mods. So let's see how we can bolster this gameplay philosophy, and ensuring every weapon has a meaningful role to fulfill. Starting with the relationship between your starting and utility weapon. The bread and butter of Halo CE, the assault rifle and pistol. The iconic assault rifle, known in love for its huge 60 round magazine and high rate of fire. The weapon has a very generous degree of bullet magnetism and an extremely wide cone of spread, making this glorious bullet hose your go-to in the early game for mowing down crowds of grunts and suppressively rushing down foes at close quarters. If I had to venture a guess, it was probably designed this way to ease players into first-person shooters on console. Because of that high level of spread and magnetism, aiming matters least with this gun, less than any other in the game. Because of that, it gives emphasis to learning how to use your melee and grenades to complement your gunplay. In practice, the assault rifle functions as an easy-to-use weapon that new players will naturally gravitate towards.
However, as you learn to aim and increase the difficulty, the relevance of the AR falls off greatly, where the emphasis of gunplay shifts, bringing us to the other side of the coin, the pistol, requiring deliberate aim and careful placement of shots to succeed with, it being much harder to use than the AR but with significantly wider utility, capable of killing unshielded foes with one shot to the head and engaging from much longer ranges. For that higher skill floor, you have a weapon that is much more broadly effective and rewarding to master. This weapon dynamic I feel is a key part of Halo's accessibility, while still offering so much depth in the long term, providing ample room for newbies to blast away with nary a care, yet also leaving tons of space to learn and improve, to express that accumulated skill through harder to use weapons that boast farther reaching utility. So I'd like to preserve this fundamental dynamic. But what if we better allowed easier to use weapons to maintain relevance and fun use even at high level play and higher difficulties? In the Assault Rifle's case, through one simple change, tightening the minimum initial spread of the weapon while keeping the wider maximum spread the same. In this way, the AR retains its role as the easy to use bullet hose when running full auto, but now has a higher skill ceiling in rewarding mastering measured burst fire, giving the weapon greater flexibility outside of extreme CQC. In my experience, this change actually complements the core rushdown loop of this gun, and better allowing you to bridge the gap between you and the enemy. This added flexibility gives the weapon more opportunity to shine even on legendary, but only through skilled use of its fire patterns. We can ensure all weapons of the sandbox maintain relevance through this kind of added depth, and further their emphasis of their various unique roles. Which then leads us into the next, equally important pillar of Halo's sandbox dynamics, damage types. The main two being the dichotomy between bullet and plasma. The idea being that bullet shreds health and plasma drains energy shield, such as that of the defensive scouts and the jackals, the keystone squad leaders and the elites, or all around melting the flying sentries and the sentinels. The key players in this instance being the plasma pistol and plasma rifle. The former capable of firing as fast as your trigger finger allows, and charging up to release a highly damaging bolt that instantly depletes any shields. The latter capable of full auto firing, with a much faster projectile suitable for longer range engagement. Both featuring heat based action, for tempered firing discipline allows the weapons to be fired indefinitely so long as the batteries still have juice left, making these weapons function much differently from magazine fed arms. These two weapons were very effective for stripping the shields of enemies and getting them vulnerable. However, the plasma pistol, due to its overwhelming abundance and high degree of flexibility, even versus enemy health, was almost always your go-to for that job. That said, the plasma rifle in vanilla still boasted a role its own in being the most consistent mid-range weapon when it came to dealing damage per second and laying down that suppressive fire from a safe distance. However, that then brings up a conundrum, one which illustrates how sandbox balance is all interconnected. Remember, we made the AR now capable of putting in good damage at mid-range given a skilled trigger finger, so that now means the plasma rifle needs some sort of adjustment to ensure it remains in a role it can call its own. My answer here comes in three steps, starting with the plasma pistol. Its overcharge is without a doubt the most efficient, safest, and easiest method of draining any target's shields, no matter how strong they were. So far we've talked about ease of use and skilled utility, but there's another angle of balancing we can tap into, cost of use. If we make the plasma pistol's overcharge go from spending 11% of the battery to now 20%, the long-term viability of your shield stripper now becomes a much more important factor to consider. So by that line of logic, the next step would involve slightly decreasing the plasma rifle's battery charge spent per shot, so that you can hold on to it for a bit longer. The last step, taking the PR's random damage roll from 12 and 14 to 13 and 14, making its damage output more consistent and reliable. Because of these three changes, we've added a dynamic of the plasma pistol and its overcharge being easy and effective, but costly to use, while the plasma rifle is more consistent and economic, better suited for ranged suppressive fire and or versus more than one shielded foe. All this shows how Halo's sandbox balancing isn't just about tuning weapons in a vacuum, but how they interact and overlap with one another. Just with these four weapons alone, when pit against the distinct behaviors and AI roles of the grunts, jackals, and elites, Halo already has the core of a very compelling gameplay loop, anchored around how you use your weapons in each situation, and how you express your skill. Casually mulling through grunts with the assault rifle, efficiently stripping jackal shields one by one with the plasma rifle, or blasting elite shields away with the plasma pistol, followed up by a precise pistol shot, to send the rest of the squad into panic. Halo's memorable AI personalities and interactions being a core pillar of its success in its own right, creating interplay with each part of the sandbox in unique ways. 
Where other shooters have five variations of an assault rifle that all accomplish the same task versus enemies that all behave and react in the same way, Halo features a gold mine of potential when it comes to creating a rich content roster and ways of minimizing redundancy in the sandbox. Which is a great time to move on to the Needler, one of Halo's most iconic and creative weapons. Firing homing pink needles and with enough attached creates a super combining, highly punishing explosion. That said, in spite of such an interesting concept and function, the Needler in vanilla CE really struggled to find any role to fill. When it connected, its super combine was excellent for tearing elites down, but its excessively slow projectile speed when faced with the elite's swift strafing action made this weapon far too inconsistent to stand out from any role that wasn't already filled by other, better options. In my onion, the Needler didn't truly come into its own until Halo 3, where through much faster firing and projectile speed, it allowed it to shine and develop a role for efficiently and quickly wiping out singular, high-value targets like Brutes or the Spongy Flood pure forms. Harkening back to an earlier point, its high cost of use and needing to spend the entire mag to accomplish this task ensured this weapon remained balanced in a distinct role, as its highly focused firing made it more overkill and impractical for weaker targets like grunts. And so that's the direction I took here with the Needler. In speeding up its projectile speed a tad, the weapon is able to connect more consistently and thus able to shine in a similar role of focused fire on high value targets, in this case, elites and hunters. The super combined shield blasting side effect works wonders for shredding them down, especially if you can strategize to set them off around discarded grenades to glorious explosive effect. In giving the Needler new relevant utility versus hunters, this gives us an opportunity to talk about them, the last of the main four players in the Covenant roster. The hunters are the Covenant's designated heavy attack units. Always appearing in pairs, they serve as mini-bosses all about planning your approach and rewarding precision in your shots and movements as you maneuver through their swings to deliver pain to their bright orange, fleshy goodness. I'm not sure the reason why, but their flesh and CE is considered their head, so the pistol and sniper rifle are capable of taking them down in just one shot to that area. No doubt this element is fun to take advantage of, swerving around their melees to deliver one decisive blow, but I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking there are better ways of creating interesting gameplay with these enemies, which are meant to be imposing threats. Bungie certainly thought so too, looking at the hunters in every game since. So in this case, what if we were to shift the hunter's check from the pistol to the needler? The weapon is already capable of attaching needles straight onto their blue armor plating, but let's tweak things to where hunters take much more damage from the sadistic pink skewers when hitting their flesh. From this change, the lovingly coined Hunter Dance is given more time to shine, weaving and sidestepping the hunter's predictable melee attacks to continue hammering away at their weak point, managing your distance so as not to get caught in your own super combines, making for what I feel is a much more engaging and satisfying combat loop in tearing the worming armored behemoths apart and taking them down efficiently. It's important that the hunter encounters are given a threat and longevity befitting of their characters, but equally important is to provide players with a number of ways to take them down more quickly. So along with these changes to the pistol and needler, let's explore some of the hunter's other sandbox interactions. Let's add a distinction in how bullets and plasma damage the hunters. Let's make most bullets incapable of damaging hunters to their thick armor plating, while tuning the damage to their flesh so as to further reward the hunter dance. This then makes plasma weapons unique in their ability to chip hunter health, even with shots to their armor. By that same logic, let's give the Shades Herd a more important role in dealing massive damage to hunters, even to their armor. The idea being the vehicle and its heavy utility is capable of melting hunters into bubbly orange goo in seconds, but as you cannot move, you risk leaving yourself a sitting duck and being blasted. Which then brings up how heavy weapons in general damage them. Given the lack of the one-shot cheese now, explosives like the rocket launcher are much more relevant to save for the spiky monsters. I also think the plasma grenades should damage them much more compared to vanilla. CE's hunters are particularly difficult to stick, given their fast movements and their arm-mounted shields deflecting any projectiles sent their way. So now you can use plasmonades to chip them before moving in, or if you're dedicated and skilled enough, stick them repeatedly. And that now brings us to the sniper rifle. The staple of any FPS, a weapon laser focused on tight aiming and rewarding kill shots made difficult to accomplish through its low magnetism and small magazine size. In regards to the hunters, since their flesh is no longer considered their head, that means we need to tweak how the sniper rifle damages them. I think it's fair that it be capable of chipping their HP with shots to their armor, but to their flesh, two well-placed shots I think is the sweet spot here. To quickly and cleanly take them down given precise aim and good timing. 
In vanilla CE, the sniper was decidedly made to do almost no damage to vehicles, surely to give importance to heavy power weapons for that job. However, with the way the weapon is framed as a high-powered, similarly rare weapon, I believe it's more intuitive to players that it deal at least some amount of damage. As such, while it's by no means an anti-vehicle powerhouse now, it's good that it be capable of chipping vehicle health a bit, just like CE's pistol. The true anti-vehicle role of CE's arsenal falls upon the beloved rocket launcher. As honest as a weapon gets, a heavy power weapon that transforms enemy vehicles into fiery slabs of debris. Often too is it useful against tight clusters of infantry, especially when elites are present. To that end, I think the explosion radius could be enlarged by a bit. As in vanilla, it was actually smaller than the frag grenades. So with that larger boom radius, it better fulfills a role of clearing rooms quickly, its effective radius feeling more natural. Speaking of feeling natural, I'd like to bring up that every weapon in CE has its own unique and memorable whacking animation. In the rocket launcher's case, hurling the weight of the entire weapon over the enemy's cranium. You would expect that such a heavy and slow animation would output more damage, but this is hardly the case. It, and the needler, which stabs enemies with its readied ammunition, has negligible difference in damage. And that just doesn't feel right. So, to better match the animations of these weapons, the rocket launcher and needler feature their own increased melee damage, capable of one-shotting most unshielded foes. Not only to feel more natural with what is shown, but it also allows these two weapons to serve new unique roles in situations slinking through tight spaces. While much of Halo CE's gameplay is anchored around your combo of weapons, often too does the game laser focus upon a single weapon, encouraging you to learn the ins and outs of its mechanics and master it. In this case, the famous CE Shotgun. Becoming a permanent, unconditional staple of your weapon combo in the latter half of the game, thanks to its extremely dominant, easy-to-use close-range firepower. Its overwhelming utility is largely thanks to the Flood, the new enemy faction introduced around the same time. Along with their impact as one of the most unforgettable plot twists in all of gaming, the Flood flipped the tone and flow of Halo's gameplay on its head. Where before you engaged in battle versus organized tactical foes, the Flood constantly see you on the defensive, pushing and pushing you back, overwhelming you with sheer numbers and ferocity. Crowd control and quick thinking becoming more important than ever. It's at this point where the gameplay of CE shifts focus from strategizing to raw mechanical skill. Closing the gap with the shotgun and managing, scavenging for ammo becomes key. Keeping it well fed as you shift and strafe through the hordes of flood, skillfully timing and placing grenades so as to ease the burden on you, luring them into choke points, picking them off with a pistol while they're still far away, detaching their limbs to disable their ability to fire at you, or melee, and blasting flood carriers at just the right moment to blow the surrounding crowds into gory bits. Despite laser focusing on one unconditionally dominant weapon, this kind of frenetic gameplay loop is what allowed CE to remain fun and engaging, and to an extent was a welcome shakeup introduced at just the right time, as combat with the Covenant was just starting to wear thin. From that point on, the combination of Flood and Covenant encounters keeps the game fresh through new interesting dynamics. That said, I think it's important the game maintain that element of strategy and decisions from the interplay of the weapon sandbox i.e. weapons other than the pistol and shotgun should still be relevant to consider, even in encounters purely featuring the Flood. So, just like with the Hunter, let's look into ways we can tweak how the sandbox interacts with the various players of the Flood faction. The first, most important and impactful change being the addition and prevalence of shielded elite combat forms. In this case, their vitality has now been split in eye evenly between health and shield vitality. In practice, the shotgun still dominates when it comes to crowd control, still capable of one-shotting most combat forms up close, like vanilla regardless of shields or not. In that case, what does this change actually accomplish? The answer is give new use to plasma weaponry and flood encounters. Where before the pistol was the only real choice for picking off flood at range, now that job has been extended to include the plasma pistol and plasma rifle. However, for obvious reasons, the addition of shielded flood presents a massive roadblock for the pistol, as it now becomes incapable of delivering stuns to those particular actors at range. In that case, let's implement a counterbalance here to ensure the pistol maintains a unique, relevant role all its own. Just like Halo 2 and 3, we can introduce the ability to deliver headshot damage to their infection form cores. So both the pistol and the sniper rifle are now capable of one-shotting unshielded combat forms. So damaging, it prevents them from playing dead and reviving. Thanks to this, flood encounters have a new dimension of measured precision. From this combination of changes, you now have a wider breadth of potentially more interesting options when it comes to your weapon combo versus flood combat forms. More options to consider what you use to strip the hordes down while they're at range, before mopping the rest up with the trusty shotgun. 
Why stop there, though? When it comes to the infection forms for how much the game presents them as a threat, they're decidedly very inconsequential versus the player, even when surrounded by a swarm of the little buggers. The AR really became irrelevant once the shotgun was introduced as the close-range damaging option, so let's look into giving it more purpose here by tweaking how it interacts with the infection forms and carriers. Starting by buffing the damage of the sadistic little popcorn shits to player shields and increasing the amount released from carriers, which now instantly and chaotically burst upon death, creating more situations of being swarmed and overwhelmed. So now we can give new purpose to the assault rifle, assuming the more pertinent role of efficiently managing the infection and carrier forms, mopping the nasty things up better than any other weapon. But naturally, the more dangerous you make infection and carrier forms, the more creative methods the player should have for dealing with them. So beyond the assault rifle, this is a great opportunity to take inspiration from Halo 3, where Needler super combines and plasmonate sticks kill the infection forms instantly along with the carrier itself. So that interaction has been backported here, giving you methods of circumventing infection form swarms altogether. So with all these sandbox changes, the mechanical depth of the shotgun flood gameplay loop is still present, but rather than just the pistol, now the entire rest of the sandbox is involved in new unique ways that complement the shotgun and its anti-flood utility, where in the moment to moment it's up to you how to utilize all the tools available, just like the gameplay versus the covenant. Of course, you can't talk about the design of Halo without talking about its vehicles, providing unique gameplay opportunity and allowing the game to expand in scale and show off big environments with exciting battles. A key component of the 30 second formula, providing healthy shakeups to the core on foot gameplay. So let's go into how we can improve on CE's existing vehicle roster, both when it comes to how they feel to use and the roles they play. The Warthog. The UNSC's old reliable armored scout vehicle, its reliance on AI passengers to provide the firepower in particular, allow your colorful marine allies to shine, creating memorable experiences with them thanks to their boisterous outbursts. CE's rendition of the Warthog features the slowest acceleration of the entire series. I would guess it was tweaked as such because Bungie's playtesters probably sucked at driving the thing, so I imagine they kept slowing and slowing it down until their testers stopped barreling into walls anytime they pushed forward. However, I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking the higher acceleration feels much better in the long term, allowing the vehicle to feel more practical in the heat of combat. Judging by how much snappier the Warthogs are on later entries, Bungie evidently thought so too. Among scout vehicles, we also have the Ghost, trading the Warthog's firepower for a single-man, highly maneuverable action. Very simple in its use as a point-and-shoot strafing vehicle. And the Banshee, being your designated flying bomber, taking to the skies and raining down on enemies from high up with a powerful bomb shot, capable of hovering upon holding back with the movement control. However, it must be said that both the Ghosts and Banshee's twin plasma cannons were pretty frustrating to use, both being very inaccurate and weak, barely able to deal sufficient damage unless you get right up in the enemy's face. So tightening up that excessive spread and tweaking the magnetism of damage is a no-brainer, just enough so that strafing action and sustained targeting remains important in doing well with them. And notably, I've tweaked the Ghost's anti-gravity physics to hover a bit closer to the ground, so that the vehicle is capable of splattering enemies like in every Halo game since. Which, on that topic, Vanilla CE's splatter damage is famous for how ridiculously broken it is. Just one tap from a vehicle, pretty much regardless of your speed, will instantly kill any actor in the game. When used versus enemies, it's indulgent, satisfying, and plain fun. However, what's not so fun is being splattered by an ally brainlessly floating around in a ghost, or the mind-numbingly frustrating task of carefully tiptoeing through marines crowding around you, seemingly eager to be turned into ketchup with a single nudge. So yeah, Needless to say, we need to address this in some way. The solution is way simpler than you may think. Halo CE's gameplay engine literally supports speed-based splatter damage, so all we need to do is tweak the values to not deal a thousand points of damage no matter what. So now splatter damage behaves like you'd expect, capable of killing all but the strongest or highest ranking of foes instantly at top speed, where no longer will you as the player suffer a critical existence failure from the gentlest touch of a shade turret. Speaking of which, the stationary gun, the Shade, sends waves of tri-plasma bolts across the battlefield, being a very common piece of Covenant encampments. But it really lacked any utility or role for the player, its firepower and projectile speed being too low to offset trading your ability to move or cover. So let's increase that projectile speed a smidge to better deal with targets at range and those pesky quick-footed elites, and tone down its extreme magnetism so your bursts aren't constantly going off-target versus more than one foe. In particular, given this gun's common appearance in vehicle encounters and the nature of its heavy-looking firepower, let's give it a targeted use versus vehicles, in being capable of reducing them to smoking hunks of 
metal in mere moments, its dry plasma bolts piercing through even the strongest of armor, giving greater consideration for its use given how much of a risk you put yourself at. Inversely, this also means the shade turret becomes a prime threat when you're piloting a vehicle, placing a lot of importance in outstraving their shots and neutralizing them before they can drain your ride's health. However, thanks to its new unique sound, you're better able to recognize quickly when one is active on the field. The same goes for the Spirit dropship turrets as well, firing the same projectile, which, speaking of as these bolts are now more dangerous, it's only fitting that the dropship's chin-mounted turrets are destructible, given enough firepower or a stick with a plasmonade. And finally, for Vanilla's roster of vehicles, we come to the Scorpion tank. Despite only appearing in one mission, it leaves its mark on the game, having over half of a level dedicated to it, plowing through the snowy canyons of the ring, decimating all Covenant armor in your path. Despite its general effectiveness, the Scorpion's main cannon has pretty widespread. The intention here likely meant to force players in closer to the AI on the field. In practice though, it's really not enough to stop players from just rolling the dice repeatedly until they hit their target from a safe distance. Especially since the Scorpion supporting turret is the single most useless thing in the entire game. The sheer degree of this thing's spread is some of the most nonsensical weapon balancing I've ever seen in the series. Literally cannot hit anything even at point blank range. In my experience, players are much more likely to get in close where they put themselves more at risk when they feel they can consistently rely on their weapon. So from that angle, let's tighten up the accuracy of the Scorpion's main cannon and turrets to be significantly more consistent. With that new reliability of these two weapons, we're better able to focus on the interesting interplay between them. The cannon being extremely powerful, but reloading it takes time, whereas the turret can make up the slack in dealing with infantry or small vehicles. There's something nice about Halo CE having such a simple and compact sandbox. With such a limited range of options compared to other Halo games, it makes you appreciate each gun more individually, for how much time you spend with each one. It's a testament, then, to the overarching design of the campaign, how it made the most out of what it had, when it came to weapons, vehicles, and AI, to make such a compelling, yet notably replayable game that is lots of fun to learn and master. But that now leads us on to the next big chunk of this broader formula, how exactly the roster of tools is utilized throughout the game, and what we can do to expand on it. On a macro scale, the final element of the 30 seconds of fun philosophy is ensuring that throughout the game, hell, throughout a single mission, you're always faced with new situations with different combinations of the sandbox put into play every next 30 seconds. Halo campaigns are perhaps best known as a melting pot of diverse yet balanced and well-paced bits of gameplay. Utilizing the variety of its gameplay roster, weapons, AI, level design, power-ups, vehicles, and difficulty to provide texture and flavor to your time spent playing the game. Halo CE, at its best, is no exception, in spite of its relatively small roster compared to later entries. On that note, because of the game's hectic development and Bungie's unrelenting adamance on technical polish above all else, a project with a massively huge world, a fully functional weather system that'd affect weapons, over 40 missions, and around 20 unique types of AI, 20 different weapons, had been massively downscaled into the game we know today. So it goes without saying that a lot was left on the cutting room floor. Even down to the last couple of months of CE's development, things were being cut left and right for the sake of time and polish. Well, I'm so happy to share that with the contributions and help from many other modders, we have the chance to restore a lot of Halo's lost ambition. So much of the content cut from CE has been restored and repurposed to take the end product even further. To give you an idea on what scale, I'm proud to be able to say everything that had been shown in Halo's E3 2000 showcase, the wildlife, weaponry, and vehicles, have all been recreated and re-implemented in some form all throughout the game. Big thank you again to the folks who created many of the assets for making this possible, and for allowing us to bring CE closer to something Bungie envisioned way back in the day. Let's dive headfirst into all this exciting new stuff. When it comes to how we should implement all this restored content, my immediate thought was using them to breathe new life into those parts of CE where it began to stretch its use of its gameplay roster thin, where the game verged on repetitive or monotonous. So, let's use all these cut elements to strengthen the moment-to-moment, encounter-to-encounter variety of the game. First though, it's important to recognize CE's deliberate content introduction loop. Every piece of the sandbox is introduced one at a time, both to ease players in, teach them how the game works, and also keep the experience fresh by always throwing in something new. So, we should introduce our roster of cut content in a similar fashion. First up, the flamethrower. One of the last things to be cut and largely still present in the final game, hidden in the game tags and going unused in campaign. We can use it to offer a unique gameplay flow to the many repeated tight corridors that are packed with lots of bad guys. 
With many adjustments to its function and effectiveness compared to its vanilla and multiplayer stats, the flamethrower coats entire rooms in volatile flames, lighting targets on fire and sending them into panic as they burn, burn away. I placed big emphasis on managing heat through tempered firing. Sometimes it's more economic to set an enemy squad ablaze and withdraw quickly, so as to conserve fuel. Naturally, you're given plenty of opportunities to use it versus Flood, where just as you'd expect, flames are particularly effective in turning the grotesque lesions to ash. A more powerful anti-flood tool than the shotgun, but with ammo that is more scarce to find. For the cherry on top, I replaced its vanilla firing sound, which was super understated and dull, to Halo 3's much more memorable and powerful. Next up, another narrowly cut weapon featured in multiplayer, the Covenant's trusty heavy weapon. In CE's case, I've dubbed the battery-powered version of this gun as the Fuel Rod Cannon. Very different from the rocket launcher in its function, capable of fast-firing, explosive pounding of enemy squads and armor. Required to arc your shots the longer the range. Heat management with this gun is key, suffering a very hefty cooldown period when overheated. Notably, the heat function and fast firing turns the fuel rod cannon into something of a fun and valuable combo piece that pairs really well with other weapons, as you swap from it to mop up any foes surviving the slew of volleys, while the gun cools down in your back pocket. Big thanks to SOI7 for assisting me in fixing its out of place, very slow grenade throw timing, so that it's consistent with the rest of the sandbox in that aspect. And here we go. Yet another iconic staple of the Halo franchise, the Energy Sword. Still appearing in vanilla CE, but unusable by the player. Credit here goes to My Name is Lol for creating the assets and animations for this glowing beauty. This one was a big challenge getting to work, and work well, in CE's gameplay engine. But with many concessions and workarounds, I think we got something that is unique, useful, and satisfying to use in its own way compared to the shotgun. It boasting higher risk, higher reward, the energy sword here is capable of slashing through several foes at once with its primary long-reaching lunge, able to strike down even the strongest of targets in one to two attacks. But as with every other weapon, the sword comes with a standard melee as well, which is still highly damaging, can be performed more quickly than the heavy lunge, and will not drain the battery. Creating a gameplay loop that is all about managing your distance, swapping in and out between the main lunge and secondary swipe, and comboing with weapons good at dealing with flood carriers or hostiles at range. I thought it too upsetting to the early game's content gameplay pacing to be obtainable from the various elite swordsmen, so you'll have to find fresh blades on the battlefield if you're feeling a slicey dicey mood. For another piece of the sandbox previously unusable, we now see the Wraith fully featured as a very powerful tool for player use. Its bulky armor plating resisting small arms fire, allowing you to wade through waves of baddies and skillfully arc your shots to blast key threats away. For this rendition of the Wraith, I took after its weapon functionality from Halo 3. Moderate delay between each burst, and moderately fast, but still manageable mortar shots. Credit to Markle for the necessary HUD elements, and my name is Lull for the animations allowing the player to enter and exit. Filling the role of the cut heavy ballistic warthog of the E3 2000 demo, we lift the rocket hog from multiplayer into campaign. A slick dark warthog sporting a heavy turret on its rear that fires homing rockets in quick bursts of three. This explosive ride allows us to up the ante in various parts of the game to make for much more bombastic vehicle heavy encounters, either veering around the battlefield to give your marine gunner clear shots, or carefully positioning yourself to send shots downrange toward enemy armor and encampments. And next up, we have the Shadow, the precursor to what would become the Spectre. Here it serves as a fast-moving heavy weapons platform as does the Shadow in Halo 2, sporting CE's same shade turret and its new anti-vehicle capabilities. It's much bulkier than the Ghost or Banshee, and can seat two extra passengers on either wing to enhance your anti-infantry firepower and enhance the hype. Big thanks here to the Lumoria team for recreating this thick beauty, SPV-3's Masters for hooking me up with it, and Modern Sergeant Stacker for the brand new Cherry Gloss shaders to match the other Covey vehicles. It's so exciting to re-implement this stuff in the weapon and vehicle roster, and give them all new purpose to bolster CE's variety and content introduction loop, allowing for fresh new experiences in places where the game needs it most. And it doesn't stop there. Naturally, the AI at play will shift how the game plays drastically. Perhaps the AI whose presence is the most impactful of all, being your beloved marine allies. An invaluable fixture of the Halo series, your marines and their diverse, colorful personalities have always served to instill a sense of excitement and heroism, or inversely, showing you firsthand the monumental threat of what you're facing up against. 
In gameplay, I think Marines work best when their performance hinges on your own success. Sloppy play will lead to them being overrun and slaughtered, but skilled play and quick thinking will allow them to rise to the occasion and give them the chance to shine in their support of you, providing covering fire, drawing fire away, or supplementing your firepower in vehicle combat. In vanilla CE, Marines were deliberately made to be weaker and less numerous the higher the difficulty was. So much so, it's straight up impossible to keep them alive in certain missions without constant save scumming, regardless of how quickly you act. I think that, regardless of the difficulty, you should always have the chance to experience the bravado and camaraderie of Halo's allies. So, I've reworked the system here to where Marines instead scale in the reverse direction. The higher the difficulty, the more competent and numerous they are, which then their AI and firing patterns have all been tweaked to accommodate that and and to adhere to that aforementioned philosophy. Resilient enough to give players a chance to take charge, where they can then shine in providing ample supporting fire, ultimately making you feel like a hero. One with the ability to single-handedly turn the tide of battle, which then leads us back into our expansion of the game's content roster. Migrating back from future Halo games into CE, we now have ODSTs joining the fight. Big shoutouts to Spiral for creating these handsome bad boys, sporting a very impressive design all their own, blending seamlessly with the art style of CE Marines, while instantly recognizable as the badass elite soldiers we've all come to know. And as the UNSC's special forces, you would expect them to be more competent than their standard Marine counterparts. So let's take the philosophy of ally balancing we just explored and subvert it to our advantage. As detailed, the performance of Marines should hinge on your own success in dealing with the encounter. The Marines in CE only almost always following the player very closely and relied on you to take charge. Let's make it so the ODSTs, however, will behave much more independently of the player, often opting to spread out and employ more asymmetrical tactics like flanking or assuming vantage points, sporting polished, refined firing patterns with every weapon they wield while laying down their supporting fire, demonstrating their mechanical expertise and skill. While the onus is still on you, the player, to overturn battles with your own hands, this subtle difference in their behaviors, I think, will be a big element in characterizing them as a much more tactically intelligent, autonomous force compared to their contemporaries. In addition to that, the allies of Halo CE have received a bunch more tweaks and features. CE's Marines had a nasty, friendly fire habit. They were almost as much of a threat to each other as the enemies were to them, to the point where sniper or shotgun Marines were straight up liabilities in large groups. This, combined with Vanilla's insta-kill splatters, turned what should be epic moments of camaraderie into ones of eye rolls and resentment. AI-friendly fire is an issue with CE's gameplay engine at large, so the best solution at hand is making Marines immune to friendly fire altogether, preventing them from constantly pinging and draining each other's HP, and making up for their idiocy when it comes to moving vehicles. A broad, sweeping change to be sure, as some days you are feeling evil and wish to take it out on your besties, but ultimately it is a necessary evil. An important quality of life adjustment that ensures your time with Halo CE's allies remains a fun, memorable experience, not a frustrating one. As Assault on the Control Room serves as CE's mid-game climax filled with lots of vehicle combat and wide-open environments, Marines have been granted a new ability to enhance the scale of battle. Now, Marines here can pilot any human vehicle, automatically hopping into any one that is currently unmanned, where they'll follow you as far as the mission allows, providing ample fire support against the defending Covenant armies. Really driving home the feeling of it being an all-out war between UNSC and Covenant. I don't want to spoil too much regarding the Marines, but for one more small added detail, as you reach the bridge of the ship on Truth and Reconciliation, if by that point you've lost too many Marines, your survivors will opt to continue following you in search of the captain, as opposed to leaving themselves behind regardless of how many men were lost. As we've expressed many times thus far, it's always useful to look at the future Halo installments for your inspiration on how we can improve CE and prop up its content roster. In this case, I've gone and added many ranks new to CE, inspired from future Halos, which are gradually introduced to shake up parts of levels and ensure things stay fresh. First up, we got the Grunt Heavy, a specialist class of grunt sporting moody green attire, whose role involves piloting the many shade turrets, employing the use of the big guns, and is capable of using the plasma pistol's overcharge. A lot of them will deploy to the field using the fuel rod cannon, giving you the opportunity to yank it from their meaty fingers and use it for yourself. Then, the Grunt Ultras and their white sheen ungracefully crash into the fray. One step above the Major, they're just as ham crazy in their trigger finger and passion for chucking balls of blue as we've come to expect in this series. CE's Grunt Major already had an overkill love for the plasma grenades, so I've toned that impulse of theirs back by a bit. So Grunts don't become too overwhelming to face, and so the Ultras may better shine in their gross lack of chill. 
Back in the day, Chris Butcher and Jamie Griezmer held a panel about the AI of Halo. In it, they talked about how you introduce them as a very important first impression to characterize them and their role in the players' minds. For example, the first time you meet an elite face-to-face -face in CE, you're met with a super tight, surprising encounter with the angry soldier. Only bailed out by your allies and their covering fire, repelling the tall alien back, setting the elites up as formidable, intimidating opponents you'll have to contend with. When you're first put into direct contact with grunts, it's against merely three. By then, you're armed, easily striking the frail little guys down and throwing them into panic, framing them as a weak fodder who will scatter quickly without a leader. So let's take this idea and extend it to some other AI. Let's rework the introduction of the jackals on the second mission, first to be seen from a distance where they'll retreat further back into the canyon to set down and block your path, showing how the jackals play the role of a defensive scout, and giving players the chance to experiment with the many ways they can deal with them. By that same vein, let's talk about the Special Operations Division, framed as top dog, the most frighteningly skilled warriors the Covenant has to offer. While they were certainly a step up from the usual Covey roster, the Spec Ops tended to come off more as reckless fodder for chain reactions given their insane penchant for explosives in close spaces. So let's refine some of their behaviors and redesign their introduction to present them more appropriately as the extremely dangerous, formidable special forces they're meant to be. Showing them to make maximum use of their surroundings, filling the space and surrounding the player, forcing you into the defensive and to outsmart them. Furthermore, to take inspiration from Halo 2, the higher difficulties will more often see you facing off against camouflage spec ops, making you carefully bob and weave through cover to intercept and pick the stealthy bastards off. The spec ops in CE were specifically created to offer something new for the Covenant encounters in the late game, and contributed to an increase in the difficulty curve. So by that same vein, another thing we can add to spice up Covey encounters around the midpoint in particular are Jackal Ultras. Migrating from Halo 3 rebalanced, these boys strategically stack together to form defensive blockades with their bright pink shields, wielding plasma rifles and sending suppressing fire your way. They're sort of a hyper focus on the Jackal's defensive role. You can either pick them off one by one, in which they will scatter as you do, or you can find ways to quickly wipe out big clusters of them in an instant. In retrospect of how future games frame the elite zealots as extremely high-ranking and valuable leaders, I find it pretty silly in vanilla just how many can appear on Legendary in particular. So, to address that and add greater variety to the AI roster, let's substitute a number of those gold-clad elites with the lower-ranking white-clad elite ultras of later games, filling the same role as commanders but which are more reasonable in their numbers. The highest ranked of the standard Covenant infantry, fighting on the battlefield with fury and conviction. The Elite Ultras replace every plasma rifle wielding zealot, and are similarly quick to anger going into an aggressive berserk when getting in close. I feel this then allows us to take the zealots that we left in, and have him put up a much tougher fight. Higher health, faster shield recharge, and the ability to lob plasma grenades to make up for their lack of ranged capability. Weightier encounters more befitting of their extremely high ranking roles as commanders of entire armies. Before the elites reached the final stages of their design, the E3 2000 demo got us a look at an earlier concept of the elite commander archetype. Crimson clad armor decked out with the energy sword, and a special arm mounted plasma shield that never made it into the game. Well, I'm proud to reveal that this spicy elite has been restored, which I've taken to calling the Elite Vanguard. With thanks to the Lemuria team once again for its creation, and Masters for further adjustments. This is a special class of Elite that will only appear on Legendary, for that extra bit of spice that makes the Legendary of these games memorable, and something unique to face for those who have mastered the game. Compared to other elite swordsmen, this warrior buys us time a bit more before rushing in for the kill, strafing and deflecting shots with his shield. Next up, we have another cut AI that remains hidden in the game files, as its time just wasn't right. Until now. Say hello to CE's rendition of the blobby, gooey, floating squid we all love, the Engineer. Serving the same role as an ODST in Reach, these things are hovering, non-combat units, deployed into high-value locations to observe, survey, and interface with abandoned Forerunner facilities and tech that are so precious to the Covenant's religious endeavors. As such, they have no means to defend themselves, but as they're essentially slaves of the Covenant, one which contain valuable intel, they've been strapped and stuffed with explosives, ensuring the destruction of any gathered information if they're to be captured. On the other hand, you can use this to your advantage. Engineers will often be seen around other Covenant troops. Similar to the Flood Carriers, you can strategically pop them to release their attached explosives, and send the surrounding troops to hell in a flurry of chaotic destruction. Though remember, the engineers contain valuable intel, possess abilities that no one else does, and they hate the Covenant just as much as we do. So perhaps weigh your options toward them, to decide if it's really worth unleashing your inner sadistic maniac.
As was plain to see up to this point, the Flood have received a giant makeover. With credits of My Name is Lowell for all of this new variety, the Flood now possess a whole slew of variants that reflect the many forms of their infected hosts. Which helps a ton in keeping visual diversity fresh, and makes for some creative gameplay potential. Taking after Spiral's ODST design, Lull has created ODST variants for the Flood. For these guys, I use them as special fixtures of the various Flood encounters that will drop a randomized set of equipment upon death, AR, shotgun, sniper ammo, rockets, or even a health pack. So take note when they're around, they may just drop something you can use. Also implementing Infected Elite Spec Ops with much higher health than the lower ranking shielded forms. Both these guys and the infected ODSTs behave more intelligently than the others, actually dodging and evading your attacks, managing their distance and displaying remnants of their host's highly skilled tactical knowledge. A big aspect of the Flood gameplay and tone-wise is their tactic of swarming the player and hunting you down. Halo CE has many places which feature respawning Flood waves meant to overwhelm you, where the intention was for you to force your way through and juggle them through smart gunplay and swift movement. However, a lot of the Flood spawners ended up driving you backwards and trapping you in place until they stopped coming, turning levels that go hard on this kind of design into a slog, especially on Legendary, where intended methods of clearing some of these fights was flat out unreasonable for most players to achieve. So. I've taken a number of actions for these types of encounters. They've either been outright removed, reworked to functionally push the player forward to escape, or redesigned the area layouts to better allow you to push through. In further fine tuning and balancing the flood, we can't go on without mentioning the rocket flood. Pretty much the only instance of CE having an outright broken, unbalanced enemy type. Capable of insta killing you in vanilla with barely any warning, sadistically placed in close quarters encounters where you have no way to react to them other than to memorize their spawns. So, their damage versus the player and the delay before firing their weapon has been tweaked to be much more reasonable and fair. Half their encounters were rebuilt to account for their presence in some manner, while the other half instead sees them replaced with less damaging fuel rod wielding elite forms. These variants in particular don the role of the Flood Elite Ultras. Lastly for the Flood, I've created an infected Flood Zealot. Wielding the energy sword, boasting the strong vitality of their host, these beasts are bursting with energetic rage and will furiously rush you down, chasing you to the ends of this ring until they're put down for good. So watch your back, never know when one might rear its ugly dangling head. As the focus of Halo is strongly driven by this interesting, mysterious ring world, Bungie planned to implement a wide variety of wildlife into CE, only to be cut before the bulk of development really took off. Well, here we have the chance to restore that lost dimension of the game's world. Halo is now teeming with wildlife in many missions. Whether it be the quad wings and butterflies fluttering through the air, created by the Lemuria team, or the more complex land roaming beasts created by SOI-7. The blind wolf, borrowed from SBV-3, are a feisty creature which travels in packs and grazes the open landscapes. The thorn beast, making its first debut in any CE mod, is a lumbering, intimidating beast that roams steep terrain near bodies of water. While both of these alien animals are docile, they will attack if provoked. The blind wolves are rushing you down to chomp at you with those big teeth, albeit scaring easily when faced with vehicles. The thorn beast being extremely tough and very dangerous, relentlessly pursuing you till justice has been dealt. So poke these guys at your own risk. Or perhaps you could stir these beasts up on purpose and set them loose on nearby enemies. I'm sure they don't discriminate when keeping the peace of this ring. So as you can tell, there are a ton of methods we can take in ensuring Halo's 30 seconds of fun always remains fresh through the expansion of the content roster and how it's all used. Thank you so much once again to the many modders for their help in restoring all these lost pieces of Halo CE's DNA. It's fun to step back and see what it all could have perhaps looked like had Bungie had that extra bit of development time. Much of the pre-release material shown for Halo CE showed off just how massive they planned for all the environments to be. And much of that still shows with how uniquely open-ended CE's missions are compared to future titles. I think there's a lot of fun to be had here when it comes to leaning into this strength and further expanding the exploration value of these missions. As such, a ton of missions have been opened up in new and exciting ways, making use of parts of levels that previously went unexplored. The Silent Cartographer, Halo's best mission to showcase this, already being among the most free range, now opens up way more of the island for you to discover and explore as you progress through the mission. 
343 Guilty Spark is famous for its restrained tension building, a perfect midway change of pace with its introduction of the Flood. But aside from that, it's a pretty simple mission once you get down to it. Here, I've added a whole new layer of exploration value to the underground facilities, adding methods of opening up the different parts of the labs and its systems, making for ways observant and smart players can completely change how your progression through these Flood-infested chambers plays out. Two Betrayals sees a whole bunch of its empty or unused areas give a new purpose, with lots to discover that will aid you in the large-scale three-way battles and give you an edge to push through the many entrenched enemy lines. With credit to much work from the modern mindful moron, the Ma sees lots of previously inaccessible areas from the first mission restored, opening up a new variety of paths you can take through the mission with new horrors lurking in the pitch dark, showing just how much everything has fallen into chaos with the release of the Flood. Halo CE, especially with these new expansions, has a really nice ebb and flow of linear and open mission progression, which complement each other on a level-to-level -level basis and lets the game a good sense of pacing. Let's let's force people through a tunnel so that then when they come out of the tunnel, it's, it, the contrast really blows their mind. While we're talking about level changes, I want to bring up how the encounters surrounding the heart of Halo, the Control Room Pyramid, have changed. In vanilla, Assault on the Control Room was so long that by the time you reached the control area, things had kind of fizzled out. For such a pivotal moment in the game's narrative, there was barely any gravity or bravado to climbing the ziggurat and securing Halo's control room. Well now, this entire segment has been completely transformed into a giant battle of you and your marines storming the canyon, neutralizing enemy defenses, and ascending the ziggurat in a challenging gauntlet, making for a much more exciting segment befitting of the mid-game climax. But as you and the marine forces have secured the entire location, that leads a lot of implications for the start of two betrayals, when you return to the area. By the second half of Vanilla CE, the marines completely disappeared from the narrative, leaving you to fight alone for the entire rest of the game. While this worked to instill a feeling of isolation and tone befitting of the flood invasion of the ring, the reason for their disappearance was likely down to Bungie's lack of time in designing the late game missions. Allies take considerably more time to implement and test than simple player versus enemy action, hence their absence in the final act. Well now, as the marines had previously conquered the ziggurat, they remain there by the time you return in two betrayals, giving us a chance to build never-before-seen three-way battles between humans, cubbies, and sentinels as you defend your hold on the control area. For such a key location of the Halo Ring, it helps that the encounters taking place here have just as much weight and excitement put into them, showing players firsthand just how desperate every faction is to regain dominance of the control pyramid. In the end, this cascade of changes culminates into giving a greater sense of closure to the Marine presence in the story, while also more organically setting up Fohammer's later arrival in the final level. Though, if you think the Marines here already had it bad with the compounding threats of the Cubbies and Sentinels, just to remember, things can always get worse. And very, very ugly. Of course, we can't go on without mentioning the most infamous level of the entire series, the Library. Reviled as the worst mission in CE thanks to its excessive reuse of the same geometry, very limited variety of encounter design, frustratingly cracked flood respawns, and overly extended length. So needless to say, we got our work cut out for us. But thankfully, we now have a wider set of tools to turn this mission into something much more enjoyable. First, the overhauls made to the Flood Sandbox interaction already goes a long way in giving players the chance to mix up gameplay through more creative and interesting approaches. Second, we need to buff up more encounters to be distinct from the last, playing into the variety rule of the 30 seconds of fun, ensuring the level's various flood fights and many areas stand out from one another, through the weapons available to you changing how you fight, creative use of scenery for unique gameplay or to give the area a unique atmosphere, and perhaps most impactful of all, the use of vehicles. As third, we must shorten the length of this mission by some means. Vehicles, I found, are a great method of achieving this, and provide new experiences at several points throughout. The library is surprisingly spacious and great for allowing this kind of vehicle combat, especially in how it lets you get truly overwhelmed with the ferocious hordes. And finally fourth, tone down the many flood spawners so that they serve to complement the fast pace of the mission rather than bring it to a grinding halt, as we've previously detailed. There's only so much you can do with the library without overhauling the geometry of the mission itself, but hopefully now, the low point of CE is something much more memorable, fun, and frightening. Once I started learning how Halo scripting worked, I became really interested in fleshing out how the game changes based on difficulty. This thought inspired by the Actman in his analysis of Halo CE when he said this. What's really cool is the difference in difficulties doesn't just tweak the numbers in terms of damage and health. Changing the difficulty changes the game. Some areas might have invisible sword elites on heroic and gold sword elites on legendary. Ranks might get higher or the combination of enemies will change. 
Even the opening and ending cutscenes change. So there are lots of ways we can manifest this idea and expand on it. Best place to show this is the iconic beach landing of Silent Cartographer. On normal, the enemies on offer is very similar to vanilla, very straightforward. Bump up to heroic, we see the addition of more foes and allies, as well as shade turrets near the back providing suppressing fire. Bump up to legendary, the scale of the battle has reached its peak, with the final two elites being replaced by hunters. This kind of variation is something I took interest in fleshing out. In general, I took more liberties with changes when it came to the design of levels and encounters, the higher the difficulty. The most radical of which being keys. The difficulty you play on drastically alters the routes you take through the ship to reach the captain, giving new purpose to many of the areas and encounters in this mission which, before, you had no reason to visit. All of these changes and additions to the levels were but a pipe dream before, but thanks to the mod tools we're granted much greater freedom in re-examining every mission and seeing how we can expand on them in creative ways, resulting in some of the most fun I've had so far in modding Halo. Great thing about modding is that you have essentially unlimited time to implement content and test it all. Thanks to that, we can take to many areas of CE that can use that extra touch of polish. In one such case, I've tirelessly combed through every level with shared environments, and restored every piece of missing scenery you'd expect to still be there. Things like trees, rocks, military equipment, and more have been painstakingly replaced or adjusted so that these repeated levels are consistent as you'd expect them to be in returning to these locations. I've also taken to giving all of the locations lots more scenery and set dressing to provide for unique decorations to make repeated areas stand out from one another, and just generally more assets and environments that were otherwise pretty barren in vanilla. And on the topic of polishing up environments, Mindful Moron was kind enough to edit part of the Ma's geometry for us. At the end of the game, you'd come into this ridiculous chasm smack dab in the middle of the Pillar of Autumn that made the ship look as if it was torn in half and held together by a tiny little bridge. So, that area's design has been overhauled. The three kilometer long Warthog run realistically makes no sense with the Pillar of Autumn's in-universe length of around one kilometer anyway, but Mindful's work here has massively improved on the design of this area to look way more believable, so at the very least, this part is much more digestible in the heat of the moment. There are so many pieces of miscellaneous polish that we'd be here all day if I listed them off, but in general, I've cleaned up the timing of a lot of music and dialogue cues. scrubbed a handful of dialogue lines which made no sense in their context. About 80% of CE's cut dialogue has either been restored or repurposed for the many new added encounters and content. escapes this halo, it will of course consume all viable hosts in this galaxy. We could use your help, sir. Stand by, Marines. I've called Echo 419 for evac. We should dust off shortly. I fixed a bunch of janky AI spawns or broken squad behaviors. I've corrected a number of technical blemishes or minor errors within the cutscenes. And so, so many more bits of polish all throughout. This is, without a doubt, the biggest entry to my Rebalance mod series so far. Not for a second did I think things would grow to this scale, back when all I was doing was tweaking a few numbers. But I'm so proud to have been able to learn so deeply about the technical and design workings of one of my favorite games ever. Well, I suppose the last thing to bring up is, I've gone ahead and recreated all of the classic mission thumbnails from the OG versions of Halo CE, just for that extra nostalgic touch and to better reflect the visuals of what you're actually playing, as far as the main version goes. I highly recommend using Nexus's mod installer Vortex for the most simple and easy time installing this mod. It'll take care of everything for you, absolving you of swapping any files in and out yourself. Just download and install Vortex, then download the mod using it. Then, when you want to play the mod, you simply open the manager and enable it. If you want to go back to vanilla, you disable it. Simple as it gets. I am so tired. This has been such a huge project that was as much of a pleasure to make as it was taxing, and I wouldn't have it any other way. But we're just getting started. 
Mod tools are only continuing to drop for every game on the MCC, so it's only a matter of time before each of my outdated mods gets the same treatment. So if you haven't yet, do hit subscribe and throw in a bit on my Patreon to support me, if you'd be so kind. Because I think you all know what's next for us. The mod that started everything for me back in 2017. Halo 2 Rebalanced. A game with so much ambition as it is that I hardly know where to start yet, but I do know that it's gonna be hot. So get set to come out swinging. Thank you to everybody and all those who helped me once again. Peace. See you next time.